Good morning to all my friends and family and welcome to Jim's 5am club. Just gone for a walk, dropped off the car to get some, uh, some work done on my, my very, very old Suzuki Jimny. <clears throat> and I'm just walking back home, but thought I'd just pull up over here on this lovely bridge uh, by this uh, beautiful bushland to uh, just relay a book summary and to click over one more Jim's 5am club. So it's Saturday, it's a beautiful winter's day, clear sky, uh, blue skies, sunny, mild, mild temperatures and it's a long weekend so many of us will be uh, heading off, getting out of Sydney to uh, just chill out and be with family and friends. So uh, I've got quite a few book summaries prepared for the next three or four days when I'll be up at uh, Nelson Bay. So uh, we'll see where it leads us. I must admit, the more I do, the more I enjoy it. <laughs> but uh, today's book summary is entitled, No Logo, No Logo. And it's a book summary written by a lady named Naomi Klein, Naomi Klein where she talks, talks about uh, branding, logos, advertising, the globalization of organizations, the advertising techniques that they employ, and I guess the sinister, the sinister side of big brands and big global corporations. So it was a little bit of an eye opener for me, so I learned a little bit today through this book summary and hopefully we can all enjoy um, learning something new and going on a, uh, a, a little adventure together and enjoying each other's company. So the author reminds us, and I guess we're all party to this, that we are surrounded by logos and brand names which has ushered in a new era of globalization. And as I mentioned before, this book looks at the sinister side of globalization. I remember many years ago, probably 20 or 30, maybe even 30 years ago, going to Greece and just being overwhelmed by the number of Greeks who were dressed from head to toe with logos. They were wearing Lacoste, um, and a whole stack of other other logos. Uh, I'm trying to remember what they were. So Lacoste, Pierre Cardin, um, and as the years went on, you know Armani, um, Versace. You know everybody was just dripping from head to toe in labels and logos and brands, which I thought quite odd. You know, given that we Greeks are very, very proud of our own heritage, our cultural heritage. But to see Greeks wanting to uh, pretend to be Italian, um, to try and express themselves as being French or English or Americaninos was quite, quite disappointing, I must admit, because um, you know, we've all grown up and got sucked into this era of wearing logos and brands um, and paying a fortune for the, for the privilege. I remember many years ago, John Singleton, the advertising guru, once mentioning the fact and bringing it to, to I guess, to my attention as well. And he, was, he said back then, you know, why should I wear a shirt bearing somebody else's name and not wear a shirt bearing my name or no name at all? Because at the end of the day, I am the expression of that garment. You know, that garment doesn't give me value, but I give that, that, that garment value. And I express myself through the garment. But it's gone ask about. And the marketeers, the advertisers, the, 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 the globalists have cottoned on to people's need 
to be seen, people's need to uh, show off, and people's need to attach themselves to something uh, bigger and potentially better than themselves because, of course, they suffer a low self-esteem. And uh, in order to raise their esteem and to be somebody, they need to wear someone else's logo to associate themselves with something which has, I guess, manifest itself into a brand and a logo which gives them opportunity to, uh, to be, to be recognised. So as you can see, everywhere we go, there's a malaka, and as you saw, a car just went past, and the fuckwit there called out at the top of his voice that there's a shoulder, uh, there's a spider on my shoulder. There's one in every crowd. Once again, we'll uh, we'll just let it ride, but it doesn't matter. So I'll continue with this vlog, even though I received yet another immature heckling by a malaka, a big malaka. So what are the uh, key points that are coming out of this, uh, this book summary? And may I add, the idiot, as he was calling out out there, he actually leaned out of his window to call out, crossed over the double yellow lines, and if there was a car coming down or a motorbike or a cyclist coming down the other way, we could have seen a serious accident. Anyway, let's continue. So the author goes on to say that uh, successful brands focus more on brand loyalty and identity than on their actual product. That's an interesting one. The author goes on to say that um, it's all about the coolness of the brand and not the uh, quality nor functionality of the products that, uh, that we have. And uh, interestingly enough, once again, this is a, an eye-opener for me, that many of these organisations, many of these uh, leading brands, spend a lot of money and effort and resources researching what is cool uh, and to try and incorporate it into their brands. So it's all about maintaining and building a specific image in their logo, in their brand, in the imagery that they try and portray. Because what happens is that these organisations have learnt that the new generations coming through um, identify with brands because it appeals to them on an emotional and a spiritual level rather than a rational level. So brands want to be known and people want to be known through the brands that they, work, they, that they wear, the logos, and um, it's recognised. It's recognised as something which is very, very big in today's uh, younger communities uh, because um, what they're saying is that these brands and these logos want to attach themselves to a set of logos, a set of values, ra rather than the product that they produce. Now, they could be producing crappy, crappy products, but it's more about the values that these products and these brands exude, and, um, and that's what causes people to want to spend a lot of their hard-earned money buying things just to uh, attach themselves to the brand. So interestingly enough, Nike, Adidas, and a whole host of other sporting brands spend a lot of money on sponsorships where they attach themselves to, uh, to individuals, to sporting leaders, people who are leaders in their field, the current sporting champions. Um, and they spend big money on sponsorship. They spend big money on marketing and on advertising. 
rather than on product manufacturing. Another, another imbecile there bipping their horn as they're going past. They just can't help themselves. But then again, it's all, it's all about human nature. You know? People want to draw attention to themselves as opposing to learn and to grow and develop. So it's all about this sporting health lifestyle. And something else that I learned, which is uh, quite interesting, is that these brands, the Nike brand, for example, is all about attaching itself to empowering women and black people. And they're not sneaker manufacturers in any way, shape or form. So the next, the next point to come out of this book is quite interesting and dramatic. And it says, and it raises the point that a lot of these uh, manufacturers, a lot of these big brands tend to outsource their production to, uh, to poorer countries, which has a double, a double impact. And the author will um, tell us a little bit more about it. The author here then suggests and tells us that outsourcing isn't just bad for workers in the developing countries, but it's bad for workers everywhere. The point that she's trying to, or he's trying to make, is that outsourcing, something which happened in the 70s, um, is quite damaging to uh, leading economies and also to the developing economies. Because what happens is that the manufacturing is outsourced to economies, to specific and special export processing zones, which have low taxes, low regulation, and low everything. Very, very li little, if anything, worker protection. And a lot of this happened in the early 80s, where, which changed everything. Because what the author says is that a lot of these companies became preoccupied with marketing and not on the quality and the sustainable, responsible manufacturing of their products. So um, the next point is really, really interesting as well, because I've never, ever considered this. Because what has happened in the advanced economies in the world is that because they've shut down their manufacturing sectors, and it's happened here in Australia, where manufacturing was uh, unwound. Because what happens is that um, people have moved unconsciously, unknowingly, from a manufacturing base, which was highly unionized, especially here in Australia, in America, and in England. They've moved from a ununionized um, work environment. They've moved from the manufacturing sector to the service sector, which is completely ununionized. So what, what has happened is that people have been tricked into moving out of unionized uh, jobs and environments into non-unionized jobs. And of course, with that comes the unraveling of job security, of uh, uh, wage claims, of the ability to work together with others within your organization and within your country to ensure a better quality of life. So uh, the author then here brings a call to action to people to try and see if they can at least be aware and do something about it. Because what the author here says that if you want to make a difference to your country, you can try targeting different multinational brands and at least forcing them to be a little bit more responsible in their manufacturing processes and in the way they market and they brand their things so that we don't brainwash our children, our grandchildren and other people into spending vast sums of income attaching themselves to useless products. 
You know, um, it's gotten to the point now where Mercedes, uh, BMW, Maserati, uh, you name it, a lot of those brands, a lot of those cars now are just so common that um, they're no longer prestige. You know, when you see Mercedes everywhere and BMWs everywhere and uh, brands, Versace, uh, Prada, uh, Gucci, um, you name it. If you see every second person wearing expensive brands, then you say to yourself, well, is there any prestige in that? I guess the only fear that most people have is uh, not having those brands and missing out or uh, thinking that they're missing out. But sometimes the best way to stand out is by not succumbing to the brand uh, trickery. And as I said, and as I say to a lot of people, as I say to my daughters, that they are the ones who make the dress look beautiful. It's not the dress that makes them look beautiful. So it's not about getting sucked in to wearing brands and being a, um, a, um, a person who uh, makes other people feel uncomfortable because they're not brand logoed and brand draped. So as we say, and as the author here reminds us, that brains, the brands and logos are a form of brainwashing because their instant recognition and reward makes people feel good. But you've got to understand, you've got to ask yourself the question, why does it make them feel good? You know, is there something missing in their life? Um, do they see themselves as being second class citizens if they don't wear the logos and the brands and drive the, uh, the, uh, the car with the logo or live in the suburb with the uh, postcode? pretty sad so um, I guess the other thing that the author talks about is that brands can also work against these multinational multinationals I've recently seen that uh, Nike have uh, put brought out a shoe with Nix written in Greek on the back of the shoe which has brought up a bit of uproar uh, because I guess culturally uh, using other people's language and other people's branding and logos and cultural um, um, icons to, um, to market your product is also fairly unethical. You know, for years um, Versace used the uh, symbol of uh, the Gorgon, the Medusa, I forget what it is. And that was their, their logo. And being Greek, I asked myself, you know, how can, how can somebody um, misappropriate another culture's uh, image and use it for their own financial gain? Um, and there are lots of examples of that. And as, we, as, as, I, as I alluded to now, that Nike, the word Nike is a, is a Greek word. And it has a lot of uh, spiritual symbolism for the ancient Greeks. And yet, there are corporates who use it as their brand name, making money out of it. Anyway, I think I'll leave it there. So thank you very much for joining me on this episode of Jim's 5am Club, where we went through the book summary entitled No Logo by Naomi Klein actually a female author, so apologies for calling Naomi a male before. So let's finish off with a positive affirmation. I'm alive, I am well, I feel absolutely great. I've got another couple of kilometres to walk home. So thank you for uh, being part of this Volta that I went on this morning. And uh, I hope you have a great and a very, very interesting long weekend where you get to uh, catch up with family, uh, do some exercise, eat well, and make, make it a, uh, a, a great time in your life. Anyway, let's finish up and uh, we'll chat again. Yasas.
and bye for now. Cheers.